Entity Framework Migrations is a very powerful tool. It helps you to maintain your database so that the structure of that database matches the objects in your code that you are using in your API application. Changes that you make to your code can then be migrated to your database so that they stay in sync with each other. I am going to show you how you can use Entity Framework Migrations with SQL Server. In this demo, I will be running the SQL Server instance on my local computer, but the concepts say the same whether or not that database is on your computer, on a server, or up in the cloud. I'm going to use a very small .NET API for a to-do app that I wrote. If you don't have your own application that you're going to follow along with, I'll put the source code down in the description. There are two main things that you need to have inside of your code so that any framework migrations will work. One, you have to have entities that represent tables in the database. And two, you have to have a database context that tells any framework migrations how to use those entities. In my to-do app, I have one entity called to-do. Here's what that entity looks like. It's a pretty simple class. It has an ID that's an integer. It has a Boolean for whether or not that to-do is completed. And then it has a string field for the description, which gets a default value of empty. You can go ahead and ignore this interface here. This is an interface that I use for some of my repositories. All it's doing is making sure that my entity has an ID property. So now let's go check out the context. Here is my to-do context. There are three important parts in this class. The first is that it inherits from DB context. The DB context class is a class from Microsoft that gives us all of the functionality we need in order for any framework to translate our code and entities into database queries and tables. The second important part is our definition of a DB set of type to do, which was our class, and it's called to do's. This is very important as it is telling any framework that there is a table in our database and its structure matches the to do class. We'll see exactly how it matches the structure after we run our first migration here in just a minute. Now, the third important part is down here. This is where we tell in any framework that our database is a SQL Server database and then we pass it to connection string so that it knows how to connect to that database. If you wanted to use a different database, for example, Postgres or MySQL, this is where you would define that. In order for us to use SQL Server, we need to install a NuGet package, which I've already done, but I will show you how to do that now. So open up your NuGet package manager for your project and install this package, Server. You can see here that I already have it installed for my project, but if you check that box and click install, that will install it for you. So now if we go back to our context file, the rest of this code here is just getting the connection string. In this example, I'm storing the connection string in an environment variable, which I define in my app settings file. You don't have to do it this way if you don't want to. If you'd like to, you could store the connection string directly in the app settings file, but just beware, that means you are checking in your database credentials into your source control system, which can be dangerous if your repository is public. So as you can see here, I'm not hard coding my environment variable name. I'm actually pulling it from the app settings file. I do this mainly because when I'm developing my API locally, sometimes I may be pointing it to a database on my computer, and other times I may be pointing it to a database on a different server or even up in the cloud. So having those connection strings as environment variables makes it easy for me to switch back and forth between the two different locations. So I'll jump into the app settings file so you can see how this is structured. Right here is where I define that environment variable. I'm currently calling it to do db connection local. And you can see these two keys here match up to the keys that I'm using here. So if you're on a Windows computer and you want to set that environment variable, this is the command set x and then the variable name and then the environment variable. So now that we have our context set up and our entity set up, we can create our first migration. However, in order to do that, we need to install one more NuGet package. So we will go back to the package manager and the package you want to install is Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.Tools. So go ahead and install that and then we can create our first migration. So once that's installed, go ahead and close your package manager. And now what we want to do is open up the package manager console. And from here, run this command, add migration, and then give it a name. I'm going to call mine initial migration and then hit enter. So assuming that everything was set up correctly, this should complete and then open up a new migration file. So here is this migration file, and you can find that under a newly created folder called migrations. This folder is also where all future migrations will be added. So this migration file has two functions in it, an up function and a down function. The up function is the code that is executed when adding this migration to the database. In our case, it is for creating the to-do table. The down function is for removing the migration from the database which in our case is just removing the table. So let's review the up function. First, it is telling the migration builder to create a table. The name of that table is todos. And in that table, it will have multiple columns. The first column is called ID, which is of type int and it's non-nullable. It is also an identity field starting at number one and incrementing by one 
for each subsequent record being inserted into the database. The second column is a non-nullable bit field called completed. And the third column is a description, which is of type nvarchar max, and it is also non-nullable. And lastly, it defines any constraints on our table. In this case, it's creating a primary key on the ID field. So now let's review the down function. In this case, it's quite simple. All it's doing is telling the migrations builder to drop the table called todos. There is also another file in the migrations folder which is the current context model snapshot folder. This file is essentially a reflection of the current state of the database, according to the migrations that you've created. Entity Framework uses this file to determine what changes have been made to your code, if any, and what actions need to be taken in order to sync your code with the database. There are a few things that might stick out to you after this migration has been created for the to-dos table. For example, why did it make the ID column an identity field? And why is it the primary key? Why are all of the fields non-nullable? And why is a description an nvarchar max? Well, that's because any framework makes a lot of assumptions based off of how you name your entities. For example, any numeric or GUID field with the name ID or entity ID, for example, to-do ID, will be the primary key. And any primary key that is a numeric field, in our case an integer, will also be set as the identity field. If you're curious about more of the assumptions that are made by any framework, I'll put a link to those down in the description below. So also, why are all of our fields non-nullable? Well, that's because none of our properties are defined as nullable properties. If we specified a specific field as nullable, we would see that reflected in the table creation. And the reason description is of length max is because we didn't specify a max length for it. So let's go back and make some changes to our entity and see how it changes the migration. First, we need to undo our migration by going to the package manager console and running the command remove migration. So now let's go into our to-do entity and change a couple of things on the description field. First, let's make it nullable by adding a question mark. And then let's give it a max length of 250 characters. And you can do that by adding this data annotation, max length with 250 as a parameter. So now if you rerun your migration with the same add migration command as before, you'll see the output in the up function to be a little bit different for the description column. The description is now an nvarchar 250 with a max length of 250, and now it's nullable. So once you have reviewed the output from the migration and you like it, you can now apply that migration to your database. There's a few different ways that you can do this. I'm gonna show you the most basic way of doing it, but if you're interested in seeing other options, let me know down below in the comments and maybe I'll do a video on the more in-depth options for that. So the way we're gonna do it now is using the package manager console. Let's go jump into that. So if you open up your package manager console and run the command update database and hit enter, it should take a second, it'll update your database. So that's it, that's the whole command, update database. So assuming that your connection string was correct, you should get an output similar to this. Then you can log into your database and see what it did. So I'm gonna hop into Azure Data Studio. And here you can see to do DB. I expand that, you'll see there's a to-dos table. And in that is our ID, our completed column, and our description column with a max length of 250. Now one last thing, you'll see there's another table here called EF Migrations History. And if we select everything out of that, you see there's only one row in here. And this migration ID is the name of the migration that we just created. I'll go back to Visual Studio and you can see here's the name of it here, which is basically just a long name for the date and then the name of the migration that you gave it. And so this is how Entity Framework keeps track of what migrations have been applied to the database. And so once that migration has been run and applied to the database, it adds that record to the migrations history and that way it won't be run again. Hopefully this gives you a good idea of how you can utilize Entity Framework migrations to maintain your database. There are of course many more things that we can do a database has more than one table. It has tables that relate to each other. You can see data into it, but this right here is a great place to get started. So if you liked what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing, maybe comment down below. In the future, I may do another video on a more in-depth analysis of how you can use any framework migrations. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you later.